Hey, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast Live, where we talk about board games and occasionally other things, but mostly board games, but also sometimes other things. Was that like we're going to talk about redundancy today? Okay. <laughs> also, we'll talk about redundancy. So, got it. Okay. Uh, that's what a way to start. Okay, folks, before we do get jumping in, we gotta we're gonna play a game show. We'll talk about the news and other things, but. Speaking of news, Dice Tower Now is a is our podcast that we put out about Dice Tower News. If you've never listened to it, it is it goes out all the time. We it used to be called Dice Tower News Podcast. We've rebranded it as Dice Tower Now, and you can find it at dicetowernow.com. And in this uh, particular thing, we wanted to talk a little bit about what's been happening lately with the show. They're talking about this new tabletop documentary, Game Master, which we mentioned last week. And so they talk with the producers of it, uh, the challenges of getting this documentary made, et cetera. And Corey Thompson has a new series in Dice Tower Now where he talks to different people in the industry. So he talks about board game developers with Stephen Bonacore, Paul Grogan, Johnny Pack, Peter Vaughn, and many other people. So some really good stuff there, folks. You can find that at Dice Tower Now. Dot com. Also, it's contest time. Whoa, contests. Let's do it. Well, if you would like to enter our current contest, this contest is from uh, Aura Game Studio, and it's for Hybris Disordered Cosmos. This is currently on Kickstarter. We'll have the link in the description below. And you can enter this contest by emailing us at contest. What do you okay? Contest at dicetower.com and just in the subject line, put the word hybris. It's like hybrid, with, but with an S. And at the end of the show, we'll announce the winners and we'll have two copies of the game at the God Pledge level, uh, which is fulfilling in July 2021. This is for the, uh, the United States, uh, Euro Europe, and Australia areas only. And so uh, this is a modular worker placement game. It's in a universe that mixes Greek mythology, which I like, and steampunk, which Z likes. I like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would so enter this contest if I could spell hybris. Yeah, that is, is a, like a hybrid like, yeah. with an S instead of a D. If I could spell it all, I would enter, honestly. <clears throat> Shibboleth, I think. Um, anyhow, so you can enter this now. We'll get started with this going. And so the contest is open right now. And right. while you're thinking about entering it, well, let's get started with some contributors. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Well, today we're going to be talking about The Cloud Dungeon. As you can see, this is not a traditional board game. This is a book with pages. Speaking of books, I did this great thing. So you know how this year has been kind of like not awesome? I bought myself a new planner to just kind of start over mentally, do like a mental exercise of getting rid of all that stuff and just starting fresh. And it was actually really, really cathartic for me. So if that's something that works for you of just starting fresh, I would suggest a new planner. I like it. All right, so in the Cloud Dungeon, basically what you're doing is you're playing a one-shot RPG for families. Everything is self-contained in this book, so all you have to do is bring scissors, you have to bring some crayons and pencils, that kind of thing, and some dice of your own, and you're ready to roll. Uh, you're gonna flip through dice the book. Dice of your own, and you're ready to roll. <laughs> 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 so you cut out these, these individual characters, you roll them to make their stats, you color them in. Along the way, you're gonna pick up all kinds of items, you're gonna color those items, tape them to your character so they're actually physically carrying around these things, yeah. and you go through this, you know, to kind of choose your own adventure style game. Game. The game kind of has everything right here in the book. So you read the page, it tells you to make a decision, and you mark that down. And then later on, it might come back to haunt you or to help you. <laughs> but or yeah. both. Yeah, or, or both. Yes, yeah, so we had a really fun time playing the cloud dungeon with our family. This is just cute, silly fun. And the nice thing about it is when something bad happens to your character, it's not like you've spent so many sections building it up. I mean, you spent literally two minutes building up the stats for your character, and then you just move on with things. And then when you get heard on the very first page 
it's not, it doesn't have that emotional drag <laughs> that to it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have that emotional weight to it as would a more intense RPG game go. So it was just cute, silly fun. We played it with our seven-year-old, had a great time. But if you want to hear our full thoughts about how that went, be sure to check out our full review. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. You can find us on YouTube or on Facebook. Well, everybody, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany, hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. You know, sometimes you want to go way back in history. Well, medieval times are a great time, but you can even go back to the Renaissance period or to the age of I don't know what, but let's check out some games. Rainer Knizia's Battle Lines, published by GMT 8th Printing. Hey, yeah, you're going to say, no, it's not the medieval times. It's uh, BC times, you know, the Gre Greece, uh, Sparta, Rome, whatever. The game was originally called Schotentoten. The what? Schotentoten. The what? Eighth printing, new art, medieval times, great, great art. You're, everybody's gonna learn, but why? Do you, you don't have to learn. You can just play. So basically, if you win five out of nine battles, you win, and it's called battle line because that's the formation of the cards. That's how they used to do it back then. And Columbia Games has a game called Crusader Rex. This is a block. War game, it's easy peasy. It comes with 63 wooden blocks, 27 cards, dice, and a map board of 17 by 33 inches. Really nice stuff. Academy Games has a Viking game called 878 Vikings. This is a two to four player area control game with minis. Who doesn't want to be a Viking? Shogunate, three to six player game, six clans. You control two, and you gotta finagle your way to be the next Shogunate. The next Shogun, not the next Shogun it. You dummy it. Fun angle. Kill. Whatever. Now going back to GMT again, they have a new box set which has three games. Man of Iron, Infidel, and Blood and Roses. This is designed by Richard Berg, and you wouldn't believe what it comes with, man. This is, this is total immersion. It comes with five double-sided 22 by 34 inch maps and one 11 by 17 inch map and seven and a half counters. Bo, what's this guy saying? Seven and a half counters. Seven and a half counter sheets. Shut up. And three battle books. Let me check it out. Ooh. Huh? Dinosaur Table Battles by Hollenspieler. Huh? That's amazing. We're going way back in time. I know it's not medieval there, but, you know, uh, they must have had their medieval history, right? Anyways, this game comes with a four-page rulebook, and it comes with dino cards. And some of these dino cards can be combined. The head, the tail, I mean the body, and the tail for a massive whammy. Yeah, so I jumped around a little bit. You know what? You want to know more about these games? Check out my channel. No enemies here. Happy breakfast everyone, this week I'm going to talk to you about an expansion for Scythe that really isn't necessary, but is very, very nice, and that is the Neoprene Playmat. Now, size-wise, let's put it into context, it's slightly bigger uh, than the original board, but it is smaller than the extension board. Um, so there's kind of an, a middle ground there that it's found. It's a very nice, soft, smooth playmat, it's got a rubber base which means it doesn't move around on the table. My table is just big enough to accommodate it with some players around the table, uh, encroaching slightly onto the actual mat itself. Um, but otherwise, it's generally very nice. The colours are more vibrant than the original board, which I think, personally, I really like. Some haven't uh, liked that as much, but I think the fact that there's deeper blues and richer greens and stuff make the map pop that bit more. Uh, the, some of the detail is lost though. So one of the best examples is that the Santa that's very sort of small detail on the board, it's not quite as obvious. It's still there if you know what it is, it's there. And people can probably guess, it's just, it's almost a bit fuzzy. Some of that sharpness of the uh, the artwork on the board is lost as it's been sort of stretched up onto the play mat. Uh, it's nice to play on. It's probably going to get used for me a lot of the time. Now when I play Scythe, 
you don't really need it though. It's, it's one of those extra accessories. I think I'd still go for the realistic resources first because I think that pimps the game, uh, sort of blings it out in an easier way that everyone's always getting hands on with. Um, then maybe get this uh, neoprene mat, but it's still very nice to use. Anyway, that's the Scythe neoprene play mat, and I'm Oliver East signing out. <laughs>Alrighty, folks, if you are just tuning in to Board Game Breakfast, you might have missed that we have a contest that we're running for a game called Hybris. And so go back to the beginning of the video to check out how you can win this game with a miniatures, an epic combat system that's live on Kickstarter right now. So keep that in mind. All right, let's jump to the news. All right, so first, Friedman Fries from 2F Spiel. They actually sent me an email that said, <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's finishing time for 2F Spiel. And I thought, oh, brother, there goes another publisher. But that's actually right, the right, name right. of their game. And I'm sure they <laughs> meant to do that on purpose. But I was kind of like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so it's called, in German, it's Führerbend. Uh Finishing time. This was supposed to be their Gen Con release. There is no Gen Con. So they're going to be selling it online. Um, I think they actually said only 2,400 copies, so we'll see what happens. But this is a game in which you're a bunch of workers who work a 70-hour work week. Okay. And so you don't have a lot to do for relaxation. In this game, the goal is for your team to get 40 relaxation. It's like a currency in the game. So you can go to the pub or something afterwards, but you might want more money so you can get a second job. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious about this because it sounds like a very depressing theme. Freeman Freeze always brings something wholly distinct to the table both thematically you know not necessarily always mechanically but like his themes and the mechanisms he wraps around his, his themes are always just outside of the box man and here's another one You're trying to get relaxation points you might need a second job i mean wh wh who comes up with this stuff it's great he does uh, so apparently according to chat it's firebend all right hopefully i got that right and someone says it means saturday yeah, well, either way. Okay. All right, Spartacus. Gale Force 9 has announced a new edition of Spartacus. It was originally, well, it still is called Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. This is the third yeah. version of this. There was a middle version from WizKids about, from the X-Men, which was essentially the same game, but with uh, Marvel characters in it. Huh. This came out in 2012, had a lot of, I mean, it put Gale Force 9 on the map. Mm -hmm. Because when, when I saw it, I was like, oh, pfft of all TV shows to pick, but a lot of people really like this game. I will say that the, the original game used stills and, and, and stuff from the, the, the TV show. This new one uses bad artwork. I, <laughs> this is, I don't know, maybe just me, but I it's, do not like that cover. It's artwork, though. I'd rather have artwork than, than captures. Yeah, I know, but... Oh, it says it will have updated artwork. I hope that that's just a placeholder then. I don't know. That cover just doesn't do anything for me. Maybe that's just me. Maybe other people love it. Yeah, I like that it has artwork for sure. So uh, this is not a game I ever played back when it was uh, around the first time. But I'd like to give it a try. I've always heard it was very intense, very confrontational. Did a good job of, of representing that part of the show. So I've been predicting for like the last four years that there'd be a new version of descent mm -hmm. a book came out descent the doom of follow hearth and in the description they said uh mighty warriors fight to save the realm from blood magic and evil in this battle so soaked epic epic fantasy novel introducing the brand new edition of the highly popular game descent legends of the dark once this was reported online that phrase got taken out so who knows? But I would not be surprised if at Gen Con or at the Fantasy Flight thing there, they might announce something along those lines. Hmm. So you're thinking there might be a Descent 3rd Edition being announced soon? Or they won't call it Descent 3rd Edition. Maybe they'll just, it will be a wholly new game. But yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
We'll see. I hope so. Alrighty. All right. uh, then we are at SpongeBob SquarePants Flux. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about that, because that's you know you're you're gonna love it or hate it based on the, that that fact. It looks you know? really colorful. I mean, a lot of the uh, Flux games don't look this bright and completely well th- like themed throughout. I don't know. I guess I haven't seen a Flux game in a while, but this is whiz bang spongebob you know there's a coin inside a collector's coin um yeah this this is quite the uh, quite the theming here i'm getting a copy for sure Alrighty. so the op has announced a cooperation with the national parks they have three new national park games and a portion of the proceeds of these will go to the national park foundation which is the official and nonprofit partner of the National Park Service. So so we have Monopoly Scrabble and Get Wild. So Get Wild, I think, is a brand new one here. You're rolling dice as fast as you can have a park with the only required animals and other players. So I'm guessing from that description, there'll be a certain number of animals, first person to rolls and wins. Silly little dice game. Monopoly okay. is Monopoly. The one that throws me off here is Scrabble. Oh, there's I also, know. I mean, there's I mean, also I mean, a Yahtzee and Trivial Pursuit not shown. But okay, how do you have Scrabble National Parks? Um, I don't know. I don't understand how is the board that you play pieces on. It is says some sort of the background. Of the... Prepare your plant and animal related nouns and verbs to outdo your opponents in Scrabble. But I already struggle in Scrabble to think up any words. If I'm stuck with, like, categories, don't you think that'd be worse? That'd be really difficult, yes. But this game is not for us. This is for smart people, Tom. Eh, yeah, there is that. This Monopoly, I bet, is a very attractive version of Monopoly, though. Hmm. Sure. And, and maybe the Scrabble version is a pretty version of Scrabble, because Scrabble is not a looker at all. Sure, but if, it's, if the rules imply that you need to be using animal related words good night i'm yeah all right asmo day has acquired libelude we should we should just have like our monthly news and it's called what has asmo day bought now um now <laughs> yeah libelude actually is a company i thought asmo day kind of owned anyway i guess they were just distributing their stuff they're maybe mostly the, known yeah maybe the 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 topic should be didn't Asmodee own this already? And then we go from there. <laughs> yeah. So Liverpool's best known for Dixit. And they also have Mysterium and Seasons and Obscurio. Great art, great components. But it's Dixit is the main thing. The founder is leaving the company to, quote unquote, develop other entrepreneurial projects. Okay. They have 19 employees. And um, they now have 18 publishing studios worldwide, Asmodee. And they're in 18 different countries on four continents. So this company, Libelude, was founded in 2008. So it took them 12 years to get bought by Asmo Day. So we're kind of behind schedule here. We should have been bought already. Yeah, but we haven't really been keeping up with our publishing. That's the thing. All righty. Unless they count videos going live as publishing videos, which I do. But uh, maybe Asmo Day does not. Oh, welcome new member, Carrie. Huzzah! All right, Carrie is an Asmo Day fanatic. Oh, you mentioned Asmo Day, she, she joins. <laughs> I know, but you mention him, she's there. All righty, the Dwarves from Pegasus gets a big box version. Now, this is a game I just recently I I, I uh, put this as part of one of my eight negative reviews. I didn't really like it. I thought it was generic. It's a boring uh, cooperative game, but apparently over in Europe, the Dwarves, which is based on some novels, is a pretty big deal. Right. Uh, this game actually came out several years ago in, I think, 2012. Uh, but then I think I got it last year. Maybe it had just come in English or whatever. So now there's a big box version of this. <sighs> i got to be honest. I'm not interested in this at all, but some people might be. It's going to include the game and then, I guess, all the expansions. There's four expansions for the game. So go figure. I mean, if the game's getting a big box, somebody's... Uh interested so yeah yeah like you said i think this is a bigger deal in europe and it's it's gotten a lot of love so cool 
Big box, another big box. I think we mentioned this in the past, but we finally have a picture of the Hansa Teutonica big box coming from mm. Pegasus Spiel. Now, Hansa Teutonica, the original game, is one of the bo most boring-looking games in existence. This this cover looks a lot nicer. I really like how this looks. It's pretty good, pretty good. I like uh, the uh, frame, the bridge frame to separate the three box covers. Yeah. I, I really like that. I don't know. Did you ever play this game, Z? I did. It's been a long time, but I did. I remember liking it, but thinking the theme was dry and boring. The game itself is an engine-building style game. So maybe this will make it more palatable. We'll see um, mm -hmm. how it plays now. Alrighty, Wizards of the Coast has announced Magic the Gathering production delays. Now, we're seeing a lot of delays, um, and I just mention this because you know this is probably going to continue to happen. Uh, fortunately, everything's not as delayed as we thought. We're still seeing a lot of games released now for Gen Con and Essen. Um, but with with uh, the COVID-19, this is stifling the supply chain. So their Commander Collection Green was originally slated for December, and they pushed it back to December. So September. It was originally for September. Got pushed to December. Sorry. What did I say? You said December both times. Right. So they pushed it back from December to December. Got it. I think I have it now. All right. Yeah, yeah that was right. Yeah, that was right. At the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a really interesting news. The Amazon marketplace is no longer anonymous. So what this means is starting September 1st, if you sell something through Amazon marketplace, you have to have your business name and address there. Now, this has already been in effect outside the U.S., in Europe, Japan, and Mexico. Now it's going to be in the U.S. too. Now, practically, what does this mean? Well, this is to combat counterfeiters, for sure. Can people find a way around this? Yes. But what else is this going to do? This will help companies, board game companies, if someone is selling their product early or – you know, someone's selling, breaking an MSRP or, what, you know, whatever these things are. It's just easy to track where things are. So, some, you know, it's right now anyone can sell anything anywhere, but hopefully this will also help stop the counterfeiting. I've, we've been really lucky. See, I don't think we've actually got a counterfeit copy yet. Right, right, yeah. But Absolutely. I know a lot of people we have. have. Lucky. But this is, uh, I did not realize, I did not realize this was a, this was a, I mean, I, I, I want to say I don't want to say a feature, but a bug in the uh, American or U.S. Amazon website. But I'm I'm glad to see the change. Yeah, so I'm I'm yeah I I think this is not a bad thing. If you're selling something, put your name on it. Absolutely. Now again, you could create a false company, and there's I'm sure there's gonna be workarounds <clears throat> around it and all. But it's it's a good it's a good start, I think. Alrighty. Well, that's what we got for the news. I'm sure we'll have more next week. And again, you can check out Dice Tower now for up-to-date news and our website, DiceTowerNews.com, where we post a lot of these stories. But now we got some more contributors for you. This week we have Rallyman Dirt by Holy Rail Games, which is for one to six speedsters looking to take their love of twists and turns straight to the dirt roads, as your biggest enemy on the track is going to be the clock and your daredevil dice rolling skills. Players will be pushing their luck by using dice to navigate a modular board for about 60 minutes to secure their racing legacy. Glory in this game can be had for $56. Now, not everyone who races, races for glory alone. 
alone in Whale Riders by Grail Games. Here, two to six speedy merchants will race across the frozen water to gather the last supplies before their competition, as players will be obviously riding whales to the busiest ports to trade goods they've collected for those lustrous victory pearls for about 45 minutes. In this hand management game that challenges you to collect as much wealth as you can playing the market. This game starts at $20. Now perhaps you fancy yourself a detective, then maybe the shivers from pop fiction games is more your speed. Here two to five super sleuths will scour for clues in a 3D pop-up book haunted mansion. Your personal Scooby crew will get to search for clues by opening doors using your magnifying glass to look at paintings and much more for 60 minutes to uncover all the things that go bump in the night. This game starts at $65. So if that last game didn't scare you, then picture this. You're awake in the dark, no memory of who you are, and your only possession being a small flickering candle in the dark. Then maybe Night Cage from Smirk and Dagger will be your last chance to escape, as one to four victims will have 50 minutes to locate keys in an ever-changing labyrinth. Dodge monsters barely escape falling through the floor and cooperatively make it to the exit all in one piece. To embark on this little nightmare, it'll start at $35. Thanks so much for joining me this week, guys. If you want to know more about any of the Kickstarters that we saw here today, then join me at gloryhound.com as we will talk about all of those Kickstarters in depth and if we would back them or not. It is a live show, so you guys get to participate in the comments and let me know if you like those Kickstarters and if you'd be backing them. Other than that, I will see all of you next week. This is a segment I used to do on Throat Punch Lunch, where I would take a game based on an IP and kind of tell you about a little bit about the game and how it fits into the IP itself. Today we're looking at Pac-Man, everybody's original big blockbuster video game that kind of took the country by storm and put video games on the map. Most people think it's Mario Brothers. It was Pac-Man. And what you're going to get in this game is a game where you're taking Pac-Man and you're going to be chomping the pellets around the board to score as many points as you can. And those pesky ghosts will be chasing you, but they will be your opponents in the game. Each player will take a turn as Pac-Man. Each player will take a turn as a ghost. Each individual ghost and move those around to catch them. And whoever has the highest score wins. Does this feel like Pac-Man? Absolutely, yes. This is Pac-Man in a box. If you like Pac-Man, then this will definitely be it. I prefer this as a two-player game because it gets a little bit long with four people, everybody taking their turn, but you definitely can play this up to four, although I like it as a two-player where one person does all the ghosts and one person does Pac-Man. Then you switch sides and you see who got the most points. If you get to past the first board, you have a bonus board that you can play, and this is absolutely... Pac-Man and a box. They never need to make another Pac-Man game. They have accomplished what they set out to do, and I feel like that this is a great implementation. You move around the board, you got your power pellets, you're getting your bonus points, and you're trying to run from this pesky ghost, and then when you get those power pellets, you can eat the ghost, and that's exactly what I want to do in Pac-Man. So thanks for watching this. I'll be back next time with another review of an IP game and tell you if it fits the theme or not. Hello, my name's Dan, this is Cora, and we're here to talk to you today about a brand new game. Oh yeah, a brand new game with some incredibly good looking and clever and charismatic <laughs> designers. Because do you know who the designers are? Who's the designers? Me and you. Me and you. Oh yeah, baby, we're making our own game. And our game is called Cora Quest. Isn't it? Do it like that. The door. <laughs> she doesn't want to do it. Cora <laughs> Quest! Yeah, Cora Quest. Because one of the things during this lockdown that Cora and I have, have decided to do is, is... Make our own board game. Make our own board game, that's right. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do that is to kind of supplement the homeschooling type of stuff, yeah. isn't it? Because we're getting a bit bored of maths and English and things like that. So I thought I'd be sneaky and sneak some... Some maths and English. Why are you doing the walk they sent home? <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs>
yes, we, we've decided not to do some of the work they sent home, and we're going to do our own work instead. Um, d d yes. Don't, I hope the teachers don't watch this. <laughs> um, we are doing some of the work. We are doing, we are doing work. Um, so, so we decided to do a board game. Now, Cor and I have been playing a lot of um, kind of fighting. You call them role-playing games, don't I you? I know, but I... I... I only say that because I don't know what else to call them. So what kind of games have we been playing? Like, like zombie side. even. It's like the games where there's, like, the really detailed mo models in it instead of just the, like, cartoony ones. Yeah, so zombie side. We've also been playing a lot of Funkoverse. We've been playing games where you play characters fighting, yeah. battling things. and things. Minis games, Ameritrash games. Sort of adult games. Sort, sort of adult games. Adult Ameritrash games is what we've been yeah. playing. <laughs> um, and so we decided we wanted to make our own. So we decided to make Cora Quest, um, which is going to be a dungeon crawler. So over the next few weeks, um, Cora and I are going to tell you all about what we did, how we're doing it, and how it's all going. So... Um, we're only allowed two minutes, so that's that's all you're getting from us now. Yeah. But we'll see you next time. Bye bye. All righty, folks. Welcome to a new game show that I come up with today. That when I was done with it, I said, "Huh, this is awfully similar to one of Z's game shows," and then I felt bad, but not too bad enough. I'm still going to do it because okay. I'm going to play drives and play drives from the best. Wow. So today's thing is called Don't Pick the Middle. All right. Okay. So in this game, you all can play along at home. Don't look it up on the internet. Um, but just write down your answers and see, compare your scores to Z score at the end. Z, you can have a possibility here. Your highest score you can get in this game is 24. The lowest score you can get in this game is zero. Okay, right. got it. So shoot for 25 points. Got it. <laughs> yeah. In this game, I'm going to give a category with five answers. And these answers all are numerical. And you can write down as many answers as you want. You should write down at least one answer. But you can write up to four. Mm -hmm. And as long as you don't pick the middle one, you're fine. If you pick the middle one, you get no points. If you pick the highest or lowest... You know, you're fine. You can pick one. You can pick as many as you want. Just don't pick the middle one. Okay. Make sense? I like it. Let's do it. All right. So the first one, and by the way, folks, I did the research in these, so if it's wrong, I'm right. Anyhow, the first one. So basically, if I get, there's five. If I get these two and these two, I get four points. That's correct. If I pick the middle one, I get nothing no matter what else I picked. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start off with some games. So these are small game publishers, and I want to know the how many games they've published, right? You don't want to pick the middle one here. So you're trying to, you're trying to, you know, you can pick the one that's published the most. Now, for this purpose, I only am counting games. I did count it if they did a second edition of a game. I counted that as two, especially if the okay. second edition was a reworking of the first one. So the the companies are Red Raven Games, who's made some great games like Near and Far, Plaid Hat Games, who just recently published Deep Waters, Stonemeyer Games, you may have heard of them, uh, mm -hmm. up to you, uh, Arcane Wonders, so they do Dice Tower Essentials, and Capstone Games, who has been bringing a lot of games, uh, German games to America, and reprinting them. Hmm. So. Why is he thinking, everybody? You can write down as many things as you want here. Uh, re but remember, if you write the middle one. Wow, this is really tricky. These guys are all, if if asked, I would say they've all published about the same number of games. With maybe Stonemeyer being a little under the rest of them. Just well, sort see, of if bigger you think that's hits. the case, you could pick Stonemeyer <coughs> safely, right? But I don't want to, though. <laughs> no, I will. I will pick. Stonemeyer is going to be one of my picks because I think they might have fewer than the rest, possibly. Plat Hat has a lot of expansions to their games. They do. And in fact, if we went by expansions, I'll give you that. Plat Hat would probably win. Right. As but, having the most. 
but game I have a bunch that aren't around anymore and I've played many of them the dungeon run one and the you know they've done quite a few things but I still don't think it's that many I know they did the um one based on the on the video game Bioshock Infinite that was theirs. I'm still thinking they might be kind of low. And then so I'm gonna pick Stone Meyer and Plat Hat as the two at the bottom, hopefully. And then I'll pick one at the top. Leave myself a little wiggle room in the middle. One at the top. Uh, I'm gonna give it to Red Raven. Alrighty, so you're picking three games: Red Raven, Plat Hat, and Stone Meyer. I am. All right, everybody. Since Z's done, so are you. Here we go. Let's take a look. First, we have, with the smallest number, 11 games from Stonemeyer. So that's a point if you wrote Stonemeyer. Yes. The highest, the highest number, 27 games, is Plaid Hat Games. Ah, okay. You're still safe, though. <laughs> I am. You pick the middle. I am. Okay. The second lowest <clears throat> with... Well, it says 18 here. On my notes here, I have 19. Sorry, but close enough. Is Red Raven. They're the second from the bottom? They are. And that's a, that's another one you picked, right? Yes. So, that's so you it. get three points. You can't bust. Right. The second highest is Capstone Games with 24. And the one in the middle is Arcane Wonders with 21. So, folks, if you picked Arcane Wonders, you get <clears throat> no points. Okay. All righty. Let's get political here. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. So uh, I was curious if I could find some sort of statistic about presidents. So I picked one that is very important. How tall presidents were. That so you want to pick in height. And folks in Europe and all, I apologize. <clears throat> we're doing feet and inches here. Um, but of these five presidents, which one was not? You can pick the tallest and the shortest. Just don't pick the one in the middle. So here are our presidents. We have Abraham Lincoln. We have George Washington. We have Richard Nixon. We have Ulysses S. Grant, general turned president, and James Madison. Now, I will tell you this. Amongst these five presidents, one of them is our tallest president and one of them is our shortest. <clears throat> wow. I'm not... Um, You're not feeling this one at all, huh? <laughs> as up on my history, Tom... But but you really do uh, corner me when you then go ahead and ask me about historical heights. I don't think <laughs> this is the height of a bad. <laughs> this is the height the height of a bad category. Yes. Uh, all right. I'm gonna Remember, say Abraham if, if Lincoln. If you're not sure, you can always pick one. At least you get some points. If you're. I'm gonna guess from what I've seen of Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. I'm guessing he was the tallest. So I'm gonna pick him. Does the hat count? The hat does not count. If the hat does count, that I think it added like, I don't know, five inches or something. I, I, was no, I believe it. it was several feet. I saw that film. I, uh, I call him Abraham, my left foot Lincoln. Um, so Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to guess the shortest was Nixon. Was Nixon short? I know he wasn't a crook. <laughs> uh, I'll call up Watergate right now. Hello, Watergate. One of your guests there. Oh, he didn't stay there. Come on now. Don't be messing history up here. I do what I want. I just referenced... Vampire Hunter, and you're picking up for Watergate? I let go. You're right. <laughs> wow. He didn't stay at the Watergate. Abraham Lincoln, though, he certainly fought many vampires. I'm going to go uh, safe, hopefully, anyway. Abraham Lincoln at the top, Nixon at the bottom. That's it. I ain't messing with these guys in the middle. I don't know. All right, here we go. Shortest president was our fourth president, James Madison. Five foot four inches. What? That's like Napoleon height. I'm not arguing that. Tallest president you were correct on, Abraham Lincoln, six foot Seven four. Feet, 12 inches. That's six foot four feet. is actually not that tall, but the, the soap pipe hat certainly made him taller. So how tall was he? Six what? Six four. 
Six four is is pretty pretty good, man. Well, how tall are you? Six what three? Six three and three quarters. All right, uh, <laughs> I'm almost I'm forty I'm almost forty four. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, our second shortest president on this list anyway was Ulysses S. Grant at five eight. Okay, I'm worried. And the second tallest president on this particular list is George Washington at six oh. foot two inches. Putting Mr. Richard Nixon in the middle. And folks, it says 5'8 there. I apologize. It's actually 5'11, but right in the middle of everybody else. So, so no points for, for me. you that time, Z. Come on. That's what I get for picking uh, a crook. All right. I'm okay with that. Three points so far. All righty. Now we're going to jump back to board games. And I'm going to give you five board games, and you're trying to pick the not pick the one with the middle ranking on Board Game Geek. Okay. All right, so I picked these five games. At the time of me picking them, which was this morning, and today, if you're watching this later, is uh, July 16th. If you were supposed to pay your taxes in the United States, that was yesterday. Um, anyhow, um, to help you out, these are ranked 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500. So that may give you some – they're 100 apart. That's actually what they're ranked? Yes. All right. All right, so here are the five games. We have a game mentioned on many a top ten list by Sam Healy, Stone Age. Then we have a Reiner Knizia abstract game that works really well with three players, Samurai. We have Codenames Pictures, the sequel to Codenames. We have an abstract strategy game that Z likes, Czar, T-Z-A-A-R, and then we have the Battle of Five Armies. Very similar, uh, well, kind of a sequel to Lord of the Rings. Or War of the Ring, I mean. Those are our huh. five games. Okay, interesting. I thought these would be more obvious. Um, Stone Age, Samurai Code Names, Pictures, Czar, and Battle of the Five Armies. Uh huh. That's interesting. Samurai is quite old. I don't know, but the, you know, old games hang on because people never go back and change ratings, that sort of thing. So I don't think it's the hundred game. I think it might be the two hundred game though, and then Stone Age might be the three hundred game. Czar, I'm guessing, is not that high. That's probably the five hundred. It's an abstract. People are not going to praise that, that one so much. Uh, I'll be honest. I was surprised that Czar was in the top 500. Yeah. And then Battle of Five Armies, I think, might be the one who's actually at 100 here. Hmm. Samurai at two? Yeah, I think so. Wow, this is very tricky. I kind of want to pick a lot of them, but... Yeah, the more you pick, the more dangerous it is. <clears throat> I know, this is good. This makes me think of that uh, that Garfield game when we were... Yeah, it's a little similar we to it. Doing. No. All, right, All right, I'm going to do Czar at the bottom, Battle of Five Armies at the top, I think. That's it. So those, those are the two you're picking, just Czar and Battle yeah. of the Five Armies. Yeah, All right. I think so. Well, at the top, the highest rated one at 100 is Stone Age. Stone Age okay. still very popular. At the very bottom, 500 is Battle of the Five Armies. So you oh, got man. it. Even though you said it was at the top, you still got it if Weird. you didn't pick the middle. Okay. Second from the top at 200 is Samurai. Okay. All right. So you need Czar to be 400 here, right? Well, the order you gave them to me in so far is numerical. So I'm guessing Codenames Pictures is in the middle. That's right. Czar is at 400 and Codenames Pictures is at 300, giving Z two points. <clears throat> See, that's called breaking the code, baby. Well, in that particular instance, I read them to you in order. Maybe I've been doing it every time. 
maybe. That's <laughs> not true because, uh, oh, wait, maybe that is true. Nixon was in the middle also. And Madison was the shortest. Huh? Is this a clue? <laughs> I'm I'm just as a, a clarification. I'm reading them in the pre-written orders that I put these in. So there you go. All right. Okay, well, Next, good. let's talk about cars. So a study of cars sold all over the world. What color cars are sold the most? This was a few years ago, but it probably hasn't changed that much. Purple. And it's an, interestingly enough, the this it's the same order for the U.S. except two of the colors switch spots here. Okay. All right. Also. Um, oh, here's the here's the five colors. So we have white. Mm -hmm. We have silver, but I'm combining silver and gray. They had them as two separate things, so I just added the percentages and put them together. Silver and gray. Mm -hmm. Mostly because I didn't know there was a difference. But <clears throat> okay. Uh, then there's black. Then there's blue, and then there's red. So we have white. Silver slash gray, black, blue, and red. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to guess red is at the bottom. Down there with the yellow. You don't want those cars. You're going to get pulled over. Um, silver, gray, you combined. I'm going to say that's number one then. I'm assuming if you had left them alone, there might be twos, threes. They're number one now. And I'm guessing white is two. And I'm guessing... Black is next, and then blue at the bottom. But it might be more blue cars than black cars, though. Probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm picking everything but black. How about that? Everything but black. Going for four points. All right, let's <clears> take <throat> a look here. So at the very bottom was blue, 7%. Okay. At the very top, you're correct. When I added them together, 32% for gray slash silver. That's what I've got. At the second bottom, we have red, red okay. 9%. Incidentally, okay. red and blue were the ones that switched in America. There are more blues than reds in America, but worldwide, reds beat blue. Okay, so I, I, I was don't know right why that about matters. So I was right about the switch there. Okay. And then number. Two, 22% white. Yes! So black, 19%. That's pretty close. <laughs> but that gives Z four points. All right. All right. Let's jump back to games. So here, don't pick the middle again. We're talking about expansions for games. Okay. But I'm going to be a little specific here. So as I read each one... I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about it. Okay, so first, Dominion, and for all these, promos don't count. So for Dominion, these are expansions for the game Dominion. All right. Okay. Then we have Carcassonne, but with Carcassonne, I'm only counting the large expansions, the large box expansions. Okay. Then we have Eldritch Horror. Then we uh -huh. have Ascension, and again, I'm only counting a boxed expansion for Ascension. Now, they, they Ascension would come out with a large box and a smaller box, but I'm counting those. But they have to be in a box, not a pack, not a promo card or whatever. Okay. And then the last one's a slightly tricky. We're talking Ticket to Ride, but what I'm saying here is an expansion that works with Ticket to Ride USA. So as long as you have Ticket to Ride USA, you can use this expansion. Hmm. Okay. Well, I got a couple of guidelines here. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Carcassonne large expansion boxes are up to nine. Uh, Ticket to Ride USA. Things that work with USA include dice, include the monsters. That's two. And then include all the map packs. We are up to seven, eight, because six and a half counts. That's right. That's math, folks. That's, <laughs> that's board game math. That's eight. That puts me at ten by my count, and I might, I might be missing something. Uh, wealth of the USA 1910 puts me at 11. Um, 
I really don't know how many Eldritch expansions there are, but I doubt there are 11. I even doubt there are nine. There are a lot, but less than nine. Yes, and I should mention, I'm not doing any trickery here. All numbers are different. And then Ascension is an insanely high number. I really don't know. But using this as a guide, if I know anything about Billy is taller than Tom and Tom is shorter than Earl, I could be able to deduce then that Eldritch is a safe pick. <laughs> Cannot be in the in the middle, assuming Dominion or Ascension are above Ticket to Ride, and I think they are. And even Carcassonne is a safe pick, I think. I think those two might be below the middle. Which means I can pick one at the top and be safe, likely. Are there really more than 11 expansions for Dominion? That's insanity. Fine. Dominion at the top. Or Ascension, I don't care. Carcassonne, Eldritch at the bottom. Ticket to Ride is likely the middle. That's what I'm saying. So, Dominion, Carcassonne, Eldritch. So you're picking everything except Ascension and Ticket to Ride. That's right. All right. All right, so the bottom, you are correct. There are eight expansions for Eldritch Horror. That's cool. still a lot. That's a lot. That's <laughs> a that lot. Game. I thought there might be like five or six. Okay. Then at the top, it was Ascension. Fifteen. Okay, okay. All right. The second smallest is Carcassonne with ten. Got it. I thought there were nine, but okay. I might have counted something else that was in a box, too. I, I forget what I did. Um, then the... So we're close here. So you, you picked Dominion, right? Yes, I picked, uh, so Eldritch, which you said is good, Carcassonne, which you said is good. Now I picked Dominion, but I'm guessing it is Ascension, Dominion, Ticket to Ride, which means I'm still fine. That is correct. Dominion has 13 expansions, and Ticket to Ride, you are correct, has 11 that work with the USA. And you counted them all. You had the map packs, eight of them, plus 1910, the dice, and the monsters. Oof. <laughs> but there's no bonus points for that. But you still got... Three points out of this one. <laughs> All right, the last one here, I don't have a slide for, Roy. Um, so uh, the last one you're just going to have to listen to. But this one is how long these movies are. You want to okay. pick the middle one. These are some fairly long movies. All right? So we have Gone with the Wind. Okay. Avengers Endgame. Okay. The 1959 version of Ben-Hur. Ben Hur, yeah. Godfather Part Two. Okay. And the non special edition, the one that was shown in theaters of Return of the King. If I picked the one that was the, the extended version, that would be number one on this list. <laughs> so the one that was shown in <clears throat> theaters. How right, long did right, you right. sit without going to the bathroom in each of these movies? <laughs> Is that the guide I'm using here? So uh, let me see here. Endgame is uh, 320 or so, I want to say. All uh, right. Interesting. Return of the King might be second. Uh, 245, maybe, something like that. Maybe three. Godfather 2, I have no idea. Gone with the Wind is quite long. And Her is quite long. If you had picked Das Boot, I would know. That's the longest one of all of these. That's like six hours, I want to say. It's really long. Um, I really have no idea. This is a really tough one. I might have to just... Go low here. Let me see. What's my score? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve so far. Hmm. I don't like that. No, I gotta go for it. I need to, to go past the middle here. So I'm gonna go with Gone with the Wind. It's gonna be my first pick. It just might be at the bottom. I really don't know about Godfather 2. I have no idea. So Gone with the Wind. That's it. 
And then I'm going to go with... Uh, I'm going to go with Ben-Hur at the top. I have no idea. And then I'm going to go with uh, Endgame after that. So you're picking those three? Yeah, Gone with the Wind, Endgame, and... Alrighty. Well, good call on Endgame. It's actually the shortest of these five. 182 what? minutes. You said 320, but it's actually 302. But that's okay. close. Okay. But hey, so far you're good. The longest one is Gone with the Wind at 221 minutes. Okay, the second fine. shortest. They're switched, but okay. The second shortest is Godfather Part 2 at 200 minutes. Okay. So what was the other one you picked? Ben Hur. So we got Ben Hur left and Return of the King. One's 212 minutes and one's 201 minutes. 212 and 201. Yeah, I think 212 might be Return of the King. But you're wrong. 212 is Ben Hur, which means you're right. <laughs> uh, Return of the King right, is 201, good. but I think it's, I, I want to say it's 247 or something like that in the extended version. Yeah, There's a whole lot of extra stuff they added. Oh my goodness. The whole extra Which, movie almost. So I got three points on that one. You did. So what's your final score in the comments? Tell me what your final score is. Well, it looks like I made it to 15, I think. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I bust the uh, presidential question, but none of the others. My biggest risk was the cars, car colors, in which I got four. And then my lowest risk was the placement of the games, actually, ranking, in which I only risked um, top and bottom. And, and twice my shoe-in for, for the bottom pick was the top pick. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's a, the Lord of the Rings thing is annoying because I, I like Return of the King, but I really like the extended cut, and I can never find that one online. Like when a streaming service has it, it's always the normal version. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get those on iTunes or something very inexpensively. Those are always on sale, it seems. Well, see, you beat most people, though. Someone named Ferg said they got 18. That's pretty good. But that's the only person who said they beat you so far. Most people have gotten um, 10, 12, 13. Cool. I'm glad I risked it then. Nice. All righty, folks, we are going to go to some more contributors, and then we'll announce our winners. So pay attention. You still have a little bit of time to enter the contest. Go, go, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Starla. I'm Mick. And we are Our Family Plays Games. games. And today, we're going to show you another one of our yes. favorite yes. family games. Yes. King of Tokyo by Yellow Games. And made by Richard Garfield, a guy who made a little small card game called Magic the Gathering. Yes. Now, King of Tokyo is a great family game because it plays two to six players. Yes. And what kid wouldn't want to love playing with monsters? Yes. Our son loves it just because of the monsters. He happens to love the Mika Dragon. I happen to love Cyber Bunny. Whatever, whatever. And he's Gigasaur. I'm Gigasaur. And what we love about it is that the components are really nice mm -hmm. to work with. It's got these nice big chunky Ooh, dice that you get a chance yes, to roll. Yes. And if you're lucky mm -hmm. and can afford to get this card, the extra head card, you can get some extra dice. Extra dice. And more extra chunky dice. dice. And so the game is really simple. Yeah. You're just trying to fight the monsters, right? Yeah, you're trying to fight the monsters. <laughs> you're trying to get points. Where if you get, you know, a triple of a one number, you get that uh, points. Plus, you get, if you get some more of that number, you get some extra points. But if you get the, you know, the one that, the, the, claw, the claw, the claw, you're hitting somebody. You're giving That's some, an attack. you're putting some hits out That's on an somebody. Attack. And if you get the energy cubes, you get these little energy cubes to help you buy the these buy cards. The buy the cards. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just an awesome game. Awesome. We love awesome. it. Fun. Get your teenagers involved. Yes. They get to pick the monster. The and toy. little kids, too. Oh, little kids. It starts yeah. at eight, eight and up. So, Man, yeah. you can just have fun just fighting with big old monsters. Who would love doing that? We love it. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. That's it. King of Tokyo. Yeah. You don't have it, get it. Have a great breakfast, everybody. Bye.
take that in a game is sort of like abstract conflict in a game. So say you have like a war game, battle game, dudes on a map kind of game. You have, you know, forces, attacking forces, that is gonna be conflict in a game. But say you're playing maybe a card game or a game that's a little bit more abstract. It's, and it could have those same, or you know, similar conflict mechanisms in it, but it's gonna come maybe in the form of cards or the form of actions. And they're gonna be things that you can do against other players. So yeah, a game with take that aspects is gonna be a game where you can kind of target and do you know, harmful things towards an opponent within the confines of the game. A game that has tile laying is typically going to have some sort of spatial aspect to it, and you're going to be playing tiles or maybe cards in the form that are kind of used as tiles in a way that's going to create maybe a map or a collection. In this game, Perry, uh, Le Cité de la Lumière, this is a um, tile laying game, but it's interesting in that it has two different types of tiles. So in it, you have the standard kind of Carcassonne square tiles. You know, this one has different squares on it. In a game like Carcassonne, you're gonna have, you know, cities and uh, roads and stuff on it, but it also has these Tetris shaped pieces that you're gonna be placing on top of those. So that's an interesting example of that. Um, some games, some tile laying games might have um, hex pieces, they might have triangle pieces, all sorts of different shapes, but essentially what you're doing is you're taking the pieces, putting them out on the table in order to score points, to build a map, something. But the aspect of placing the tile amongst the others is what tile laying would be. That's it. Hi, Stella. And Tarrant here from Maple University. Today we are going to show you Blade Runner! So this is a puzzle deduction game, plays three to six players yeah. from WizKids, yes. which I like the theme, <laughs> Blade Runner. Yep, so uh, based on the Blade Runner series of movies and Electric Sheep and so on, mm -hmm. um, the it's a quick game, it plays once you know the rules, should mm -hmm. play in sort of 15 minutes or so. It's really good puzzle deduction game where I... Like, it's a bit of a memory game as well, which I'm generally not so good at, but still, you, I'll let you continue. Yeah, the quick summary is that uh, each player and the one neutral player has three cards. Um, and then one card of each is distributed around except for one. So there'll be one player who has three cards in a common pool and then players need to use the abilities on specific cards in order to look at, take, or trade different evidence cards. And at the end of the game, you need to have two cards matching the player who has three cards in the pool uh, to win the game. Yes, fine. Unless that. that is you, in which case you want to try to escape. And this is trying to find a, a replicant, like in the movie. And it could even be you, and you wouldn't know, which is, of course, uh, very thematically valid. Yeah, very good. So that's a Blade Runner and we are Nipple University on YouTube and also on the Dust Hour for how to play and pocket playthrough. See you next time! Hey everybody! Welcome back to Board Game Breakfast. We're glad you're here. Uh, give me one second, I'll have the winners for you. But we have other videos <laughs> going up all throughout today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. Lots of reviews, so look right. out for those. Anything interesting that we're reviewing this weekend, Z? Let's take a look. I'm reviewing this. That's coming oh, up. Give me. Nope. So that's coming up. Stay tuned for that. That should be out uh, tomorrow. I am reviewing this, with it, which is a new pretty version of this. <laughs> Any any version would be prettier than that first version. <laughs> so uh, this is a social deduction game, so stay tuned for that. Targi, of course, a two-player game. Uh, lots of good stuff. I already had the uh, review for the latest in the Empires of the North line. That review went up already as well earlier this week. So check that out, the Barbarian Hordes. Um, and you've got some stuff coming up, I'm certain, as well. I do. I'll be taking a look at Tang Garden, which has nothing to do with that delicious fruity drink. Um, but, hey, I got the winners. We have Daniel Markshin, or Marxian, 
and John Boggs. Congratulations. 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 With jubilation. All right. Well, we got more stuff too. We got live plays and things coming out next week. Keep an eye. There's a lot of cool things coming out over the next few weeks. We got many great games. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Have fun gaming. Thank you.